Well, you knew this one was coming. This here is my little ZV E10. I call him Doug and I love him very much. But Sony has released a new ZV camera, the ZV E1. And he is on the way to the studio right now because I have already purchased that camera. Now, is the ZV E1 a better camera than the little ZV E10? Yes, in almost every way. But is it a better value? <laughs> no, no, not even close. So uh, let's talk about it. So this is a bit of an impromptu video. I didn't plan to make this tonight, but my wife started working late. So I decided let's have a little fun and talk about little Doug compared to Big Dave, who's on the way. And here's the thing, I'm gonna list how the cameras are different. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about the value proposition of this camera versus the other camera. But first, let's start with all the advantages that that ZV E1 has over the ZV E10 in case you're new to the game. So of course, with the ZV E1, you're gonna have that fantastic A7S III sensor, but not just the A7S III sensor. It's also the sensor they use in the FX3 and the FX6. The FX6, that is a $6,000 camera. So you are getting the full frame sensor of a $6,000 camera in a $2,200 body and uh, ZV E10, he has a sensor from 1942. It really is a very old sensor. I think it's 2014, it's 2016. I just checked still, that is a very old sensor. And with that fantastic FX6 sensor, you are going to get fabulous low light, bananas low light. Now the ZV E10 for an APS-C camera is quite good in low light as I've demonstrated on the channel numerous times, but it is just not going to compete at all with that full frame sensor of the ZV-E1. I mean, it also has a dual native ISO of 12,800. So if you're using S-Log3, the native ISOs are 640 and 12,800. So by the time you get to 12,800 on this guy, it's a no-go, don't even think about it. Whereas the ZV-E1 is just gonna switch over to its second base ISO and have clean images. That camera, if you're shooting things in low light, I mean, that is easily the way to go. You get the 10 bit 422 as well. So you get all of those colors. This guy here, he is only 8 bit. So you have so much more color information. You have so much more dynamic range. That has 15 plus stops of dynamic range. It leaves this guy in the dust. So if you are in high contrast scenes, you know, you have shadows, but you have bright skies. So much better with the ZV-E1. It has the 4K60 uncropped and it's gonna get the 4K 120 with a 10% crop in an update. And they may overheat and it may not last that long, but uh, little Doug doesn't have 4K60 anything, certainly no 4K 120. It inherits the A7R5's autofocus. Now the autofocus is nothing to sneeze at here on the ZV-E10, it's fantastic. I have never been left wanting, it's perfect. It never loses me, but there are more options with the A7R5's autofocus. You can pick birds, you can pick animals, you can pick planes and trains and automobiles and Steve Martin, whoever you wanna pick, you can just click on it and it is there for you. It has that AI chip, so it's that smart autofocus. You can do twirls, you can be figure skating, it'll never lose you. Rolling shutter, the rolling shutter is so much better on the ZV-E1 that it's crazy. This is something I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the end, I'll elaborate on it, but the rolling shutter on this guy is atrocious. It is as bad as it gets. Now there are ways to avoid it and that's what I'm gonna talk about at the end there, but if you're just gonna hand hold with just using its regular stabilization, you're not gonna use a gimbal or catalyst brows, you're just not going to enjoy the jello-like effect that you're gonna get on this guy, whereas you really can hand hold the uh, ZV-E1. That rolling shutter at what, 8.6 milliseconds, something like that, is just the best of the best. So you're not gonna see the jello and the warbles when it comes to that. You still probably will want gimbals and stuff for ultimate stabilization, but the jello of the rolling shutter and the slanted lines when you have fast moving objects going by, the ZV-E1, it's a landslide in this department. So now let's talk about that stabilization. They both have active steady shot. The active steady shot's gonna be better on the uh, ZV-E1 because it only crops in about 10%. This one crops in about 40%, which is a lot. Now you can get a wide angle lens like this lovely 11 millimeter 1.8 and it's still quite usable when it uses that active stabilization crop. However, the ZV-E1 has the dynamic stabilization now. So uh, it's gonna crop in much further, more close to uh, what this thing is in terms of its active steady shot. That one is gonna crop in about 30% on the ZV-E1, but the footage is going to be much 
more smooth. So once again, if you're hand holding only, you're going to have a camera with way better rolling shutter and also much better stabilization. And with that AI chip as well, it can do other things with that fancy cropping. It can do tracking and it can do auto framing. You can have it like there's another cameraman following you around the frame, you know, it'll just crop in and follow your gorgeous mug all around, or if you're using the AI tracking, you can put an object in the middle of the frame or somewhere else in the frame and have the camera try to keep that object in the center of the frame or wherever you put it. Clever little ways to use that AI chip. The ZV-E1 has a cool extra time-lapse feature where it'll actually make the time-lapse for you. So it'll take the pictures, but then compile them and spit out a 4K file instead of you having to take the pictures and make a uh, time-lapse in your editing software or use the S and Q function, which is what I do often to make a time-lapse. I really love that feature. My Panasonic cameras have it and I think it's great. And even though the ZV-E10 has some of the automatic modes of the ZV-E1, like uh, the background defocus button and the product showcase mode, the ZV-E1 ups the game once again by having like a, a thing where faces, if you're using uh, Intelligent Auto, you can just have it on a setting where as other faces enter your frame, those faces will go in focus and then when they leave, it will go back to your face only and blur out the background again. That's a clever little feature, but you do have to be in all automatic mode. But it also has other things like cinematic vlog mode, which I think looks kind of cool. It puts down the black bars right there for you, and then you can choose a cine tone or a different type of profile, and you can have just straight out of camera a usable cinematic vlog. It has the updated menu system, and it's also a touch menu system. This guy has the old antiquated menus where you have to use the buttons to navigate. I'm used to it by now, but uh, you can't touch on the menu to do anything. You can only touch to track or take pictures, things like that, but you can't actually scroll through the menu. And uh, this has the older Sony style menu, which is clunky, whereas the new one, much uh, more user-friendly, easier to use, and you have that touch interface, plus it has swipe up and swipe to the side gestures, all kinds of things. And when you're looking at that screen, it's a better screen. Still not good enough, especially for $2,200. It's 1.04 million dots. That should be 2.36 easy. But anyway, it's 1.04 million dots. This guy's only 922,000. You will definitely see the difference, especially when you're on sunny weather mode with this. This screen is not that easy to look at. That's why I, uh, I always bring one of these things, little LCD viewfinder, just stick it up right there. Looks great. Works great. Super cheap. You have the LUT loading on the ZV-E1. I like that a lot. My a7 IV you're looking at right now, it doesn't have that. That really bothers me. I'm looking at a gray S-Log3 screen right now. I wish I could load my LUT on and see what the picture is actually going to look like in my editing software. You're going to have that with the ZV-E1. It's got a better mic, but this guy has a very good vlogging mic, but it's when you're in front of the camera, whereas the ZV-E1, once again, it takes it up a notch and uh, it has a dynamic mic where it can record things from the back from the front and it can choose it automatically if you want to do it that way. Kind of cool. I still always recommend that you get an external mic like a boom mic or a lav mic. Look at this one from uh, Hollyland. What is it? Look at the size of this thing. I just clip this to my shirt all the time when I'm out vlogging, doing the whatever. Quick, easy, and it sounds a lot better than uh, the mics coming from the cameras, even the mics on the ZV series. It's going to have way better 1080. The 1080 on the ZV E10 is quite soft. The 1080 coming from that A7S III sensor is actually very, very good. If you want to shoot a lot of 1080, you know, especially streaming, things like that, a lot of people stream in 1080, then it's going to look a lot better. In fact, let's just do streaming as the last one. The streaming is, uh, A, it looks better in 1080, but B, you can do uh, up to 4K30 on the ZV-E1 just straight from the USB-C port. You know, you can use it as a webcam, just plug it straight in or uh, stream at 4K30. Now, granted, I don't think you're gonna be able to stream at 4K30 for a long period of time because it's probably going to overheat by the looks of all of the tests I've seen, but in 1080, you're probably gonna get a longer duration. Now, the ZV-E10 can only stream directly from the USB-C port in uh, 720. So you're gonna want a capture card for this guy, but when you do get that capture card, it's gonna be fine. And capture cards are really affordable these days. This one here is $10. And now, maybe to your surprise, I will talk about the advantages the ZV-E10 has over the ZV-E1. It does have a few, like mechanical shutter. This guy still has a mechanical shutter. You can do 11 frames per second in mechanical shutter. So you can do faster burst rate in this guy with mechanical than you can do with the electronic shutter, which is the only thing the ZV-E1 has. That can do 10 frames per second in electronic shutter. This guy, 11 frames, in mechanical shutter. A mechanical shutter is important when uh, you're 
doing really fast moving objects, let's say like a like a hockey slap shot, you'll see the stick bend if because uh, it's moving so fast if you're using electronic shutter from the rolling shutter, even with a camera with as fast of a readout as the A7S III sensor. Also, you may see banding in lights. If there's different LED lights flickering at different frequencies, then that is just gonna show up in your electronic shutter pictures and there's nothing you can do about that. Whereas this guy, no problem. Size and weight, this guy is 364 grams compared to 483. So 483 is a very, very small full frame camera, but it's still not as small as this. And seeing how you may be pairing full frame lenses with that full frame camera, you probably will be pairing full frame lenses. We'll get to that next, but look at this. Look at this 11 millimeter 1.8 and this camera, you're just never going to get a lighter situation than this right here. And what that means is you can take these tiny little gimbals here like this Zhiyun Crane M2S and get fantastically stable footage for not very much money at all and it's super easy to take around. Overheating, this guy has a smaller sensor and a slower sensor. It's also doing less intensive things with the processor. So it's not gonna build up as much heat. And uh, I, ever since I turned the internal temperature to high on this guy, he's never overheated on me. And I know a lot of people who stream for a long period of time with the ZV-E10, no overheating issues at all. So when it comes to overheating, if you're going to be using the two cameras, I would find this to be the safer bet. Lenses, you can use APS-C lenses and full frame lenses. You can also use APS-C lenses on the ZV-E1, but you're gonna have to do some clear image zooming to get in or maybe use the dynamic stabilization mode to punch in further to get rid of that vignette. And then because that's a 12 megapixel sensor, once you're clear image zooming or you're punching in, you're getting out of 4K. You're, you're doing a cropping in and then a smart upscale, but you are losing resolution. It's no longer 4K. This guy can use the uh, full IQ of the sensor with the usually much more affordable APS-C lenses and you can also put on full frame lenses. You can just have your lunch and eat it too with this guy. Then of course we have the price. I should write this like 50 times because this one is $699 and the body alone of the ZV-E1 is $2,200. And then when you start combining the idea of APS-C lenses with the $700 body, you're talking about a savings that is banana, a savings in the thousands of dollars. And now we get to what I think is the important part of the video, and that is talking about the value. What you are getting with this camera is just, it's punching so far above its price point. You are getting a fantastic 4K image. It's down sampled from 6K and it looks absolutely great. The autofocus is perfect. It never loses you. You have a little box around your eye all the time. In the over a year that I've used this camera almost daily, autofocus never fails. It is so small and light. And look at this lens here, this 11 millimeter 1.8. So to put that in the ZV-E1's terms, in order to get this same field of view and depth of field, you're looking at really about a 16 millimeter F 2.8 on the uh, ZV-E1. A 16 millimeter F 2.8 is going to be a very expensive lens and is going to be nowhere near this small. But like I said at the beginning, the ZV-E1 is a better camera. You get that great full frame sensor. So in a situation like this, you know, you put it in your studio, you can put on a fancy lens like this right here is 24 millimeter G Master 1.4. That's gonna look bonkers great on the uh, ZV-E1. The low light's gonna be crazy good. The rolling shutter is great. 4K 60, 4K 120. It's got so many things, but you really have to pay for them. You know, $2,200 for one card slot, a body that isn't weather sealed and does seem to have some overheating issues. I'm not saying it's not a good enough value to buy. I've already purchased it, but I'm saying that in terms of price to value ratio, this guy blows it out of the water. In summation, in summary, in conclusion, if you have the money and you don't mind carrying around a little bit of a bigger camera with bigger lenses, probably, if you've got that type of dough and you want to do, you know, online content creation, vlogging, things like that, the ZV-E1, fantastic. But if you're worried a lot about budget and you're like, ah, can I get it done with the ZV-E10? Yes, you can get it done with the ZV-E10. So you just have to work around some things. But that's what I love about this camera. They give you such great image quality and ways you can work around the problems. The problem of, say, rolling shutter. Use Catalyst Browse. That's what I do. I just take this little selfie stick tripod here. It's from Yulanzi. It's a little quick release one and I love it a lot. And I just take this around, point it 
at my baby blues, and then I use a 10% crop in Catalyst Browse, and I get this wide field of view, nice bright lens with a blurry background, and the footage comes out gimbal-like smooth. Or I take an actual gimbal that is this size. I can buy fantastic studio lenses for a much lower price, like this wonderful 16mm f1.4 from Sigma, the best value lens in the history of lenses. Gives you about a 24mm equivalent. You got an f1.4, so that's really like an f2.1 in terms of depth of field on a full frame camera, and that is fine. In fact, this is f2 right now. You just get so much for the money with this guy, you can buy three for the same price as the one. So you can set up three angles and just have yourself a fancy. You're doing a podcast? Just switch all between all those angles with your little ZVE-10 setup. And the image quality side by side is often going to be indistinguishable. I have done videos where I put it up against my A7 IV and G Master lenses and he holds up fantastically. But you are not getting 4K60 on this guy and you're not getting 4K 120. The ZV-E1 has many more things to offer. And if you got the money, Scrooge McDuck, you go out and you buy it. I mean, I did, but I'm a very successful YouTuber who likes to sell his blood for extra camera money. But for those of you who want fantastic image quality at an amazing price, the ZV-E10 is still a camera I would recommend very highly. And so when the ZV-E1 gets in here, I'll do some side-by-sides with old Dougie here, and the channel is gonna catch fire. Everyone's gonna be watching old Mark Bennett's camera crisis. We're all gonna have a good time. Thanks for watching this one, though. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.